Hello, and welcome to our second commentary track for Dungeons & Dragons. My name is Andy Mangles. I'll be your host today. And with me is one of the men who wrote a majority of episodes of Dungeons & Dragons, seven of them, in fact, Michael Reeves. Hello there. Glad to be here. You got involved uh, as of the second season, correct? That's right. Call Gears brought me in on the show uh, because we worked together on Black Star. And he thought I could have some fun with this, and he was certainly right. It's really a show that I enjoy working on a great deal. It's a lot of fun. And there's Vinger. And there's Tiamat. I, I never quite understood why the horse didn't have ring, wings. But... That's the first season opening. It's a title. That's a misspelled title, by the way. It should have been plural possessive. Just in case anybody's keeping notes out there. Okay, we're starting with some action here. The whole idea was to start kind of in the middle of a scene, almost as if we're like at the end of, a, of an episode and we're going to go off in a different direction. So we start with this frost giant about to cream uni. And then here comes Bobby. Hey, this is a fairly dark episode in general, isn't it? It's pretty dark. Um, that was, again, that was the idea that Carl and I had was to push the limits of the show a little bit. Um, basically to have the kids be a little proactive about their own fate instead of simply reacting to the minutes of the week, which we'll see coming up in a few minutes that'll happen. But first we have to defeat the Frost Giant. Is there any kind of restrictions on, on using the weaponry very much there? I never had any. Um, I don't recall standards and practices being particularly upset about it. Um, the yardstick was always, if they're fantasy weapons that could be imitated, that was the whole thing, imitatable behavior. You couldn't use a gun to shoot somebody, but you could use a magic wand to blow somebody with a freeze ray off the... Uh, screen that was okay now what we've got here again is the end of like an end of an episode here we're ready and we've found the way home the dungeon master's pointed out and here we go and we have the world's biggest pizza and then all of a sudden nope too bad yep was that actually the way home looked like it to me yeah that's the whole idea was that there would they would actually find a way home. I mean, it's up to interpretation as to whether or not Dungeon Master engineered this whole thing. Um, it's kind of open to opinion to how much, how very manipulative he was of me in the series overall. But um, at least in this episode, I, my intention was that they would find a way home and Vinja would stop it at the last moment, which is what would precipitate what happens next. Now this is where the show starts getting a little different. you notice for one thing there's no music in the background. We sit down, we're pretty depressed. Was that, a, was that an element in your script that you said no, no music? And I, don't, I don't think it was an element in the script, but it's something that we agreed on at the storyboard stage. We were almost home. I mean, I just, I wanted them to react realistically like kids would. That's why they suddenly get into an argument here. I mean, obviously the argument is not about who trips over the club. I don't want to be in this world anymore. And Bobby is very upset. He's a little boy. He wants to go home. And our house and my friends and... It's okay, Bobby. It's all right. It's all right. And you notice... We ought to do something about that guy. Notice that uh, Hank is twisting the bow in his hands. Eric's right. Yeah? Yeah. And we are going to do something about him. We are? We are. That's right. <laughs> Gotta love Eric. The chance we have of getting out of this world is Eric actually grew quite a bit as a character during the course of the series, I think. He starts out just as kind of the uh, buffoon of the show. But um, at least in some of the episodes I wrote, I tried to really bring him along as a character, give him a little depth to him. Uh, 
did one episode in which he actually becomes dungeon master for a day. And when it comes right down to it, he actually steps up to the plate and uh, acts the way a dungeon master would. Had you been a fan of the role-playing game prior to writing for the series? Actually, no. I don't think I've ever played a game of Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, it doesn't matter because uh, the show isn't really based on the role-playing game. In fact, it was a, a, a mandate that did not have anything to do with the game per se. It was just a Japanese place to do a series. <clears throat> and here we um, here we stop him in the middle of giving him yet another mission. Listen to me, Ranger. I'm a little worried about this. I mean, is, is he uh, just playing along or is he actually concerned? I think he's actually concerned. So then, it has come to this. That's a nice shot of Hank. Did you feel that the Dungeon Master was a little more malevolent then than uh, I didn't feel he was what he was malevolent. letting on? I didn't feel he was malevolent per se, but there were games going on that probably were working on levels that the kids didn't know. Ask her. She may help you. Then she may not. May I go now? <laughs> He's very contrite there. And they're all not quite sure what to do about all this. Dungeon Master, wait. How do we get to the dragon's graveyard? You carry the way with you. Let it begin with you, Ranger. I said no riddles. Hank gets very frustrated in this okay. show. Okay, you heard him. Let's go find the dragon's graveyard. Hank. If we find Tiamat, and if we convince her to help us against Venger, what'll we do with him once we've got him? Whatever it takes. Yeah, there's the whole thing about whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to do. Yeah, I mean, they they are kind of implying here that they're going off to go kill Venger. It's, exactly. Uh, That's the point. They're um, they're fed up, and they're gonna do something about it. Now Venger breaks into a rage, which we've seen him do before, but this is different. Now there is a scene cut out here. Uh, you'll notice as we pushed in on that spire, there were two figures up there. It was a scene between Eric and Hank, where Eric basically tells Hank, look, I don't know what you're planning on doing, but I'm with you. I mean, whatever it takes. Which again is kind of a, kind of a, growth for Eric there. Was it cut out due to time? It was cut out due to time, yes. <clears throat> so how far do you think that Hank is willing to go in this? Uh, I think he's willing to go as far as uh, necessary. I mean, in the beginning at least, of course, as we get to the end, he, uh, he realizes that this is not the way to go. Here comes Venger. And we're about to come up on a scene where that, I think, probably warms the hearts of uh, fans everywhere. Oh my god, fry the little unicorn. <laughs> but again, it provides motivation for, uh, for the kids. The Venger's not fooling around. Well, he's been humiliated by them That's for right. how many episodes now? Quite a few. I really wanted to have them, like, battered and beaten in the scene, but that was something that standards and practice didn't go for. And wherever possible, I just wanted to give the idea that this is, this is real, this is, you know, this is the Sam Peckinpah episode of Touching the Dragons. The final stand. Yeah, kind of. Where's Uni? Here we come. Now check out the smile on Pitcher's face. Ooh! And there's our act out. A little fireball coming right in the camera. That's quite a uh, uh, commercial break. Yeah. All I did was to make it as intense as we could. There we go. Your foolish sentiment will cost you dearly. And there he comes to save the day. 
Well, beyond the, beyond the kids looking to be, you know, more proactive, this is mm-hmm. also a little different than Vendra, who who rarely attacks them directly, and yeah. uh, certainly not with this kind of anger behind them. Yeah, again, it's um, you know, it's it's uh, taking it to the max as much as we could. It's a dead end. <clears throat> We're trapped. How bad is it? Well. Was there ever any discussion about uh, of, uh, actually allowing one of the characters, you know, like you need to die, or? Well, uh, we couldn't go that far, and and we really didn't want to. We just wanted to. Uh, we wanted the jeopardy there. We wanted to make it uh, have the stakes as high as we could get them. He's blasting the rocks, trying to get to us. No, Every now and then they do allow characters to die on, on the animation. It's usually the Emmy Award winning episode. That's right. It's a very special episode of Dungeons and Dragons. But we didn't do it back then. So here's where I get the idea of using the weapons. So I'll just loose this bolt of energy and then ricochet around the cavern for a while. A little dangerous. Yeah. You know, the idea was just to have it be uh, something that came out of all of their weapons. Bounces off the shield, bounces off the pole. What do I do? They're doing fast, very nice. Well. So she puts the cloak over it, and it gets bigger. Now, Bobby's the only one who doesn't react as, to make it as part of the, um, the spell. He just reacts in anger to try and defend Uni. And that's how they get away. And Vinger comes in. Vinger sure got a great design, doesn't he? Doesn't he? Yeah. It's kind of uh, you know, almost a little bit like think, a cross between a vampire and a Cenobite or something. Yeah. I think it was Bob Klein who designed it. I'm not sure, but I think that was his design. It's quite interesting. Listen to the music here. Very nice build. Now we find Tiamat. There was also a, almost a 360 pan there from yes. a, a cr- around the uh, around mm-hmm. the field. Yeah, I thought the design for the uh, the graveyard was very nice. Boy, I'm glad they don't grow them that big anymore. <laughs> now you'd written dragon stuff before in some of your work, hadn't you? Uh, yes, I did an episode of um, uh, I did an episode of this show with a character called Demo Dragon, which is sort of half demon, half dragon. The Treasure of Tardos. That was the first one I wrote, actually. So they find out that this is the place where their weapons probably came from. So because there are other weapons lying around. Bobby, look out! Better sword a little too heavy for him. This doesn't look like a weapon. I wonder what they used it for. Maybe they had a marching band? I think that was Carl's line. <laughs> Uh, the dragon's graveyard, of course, comes from the old idea of the elephant's graveyard. It's the place where the dragons all go to die. And believe me, initially, just the concept of a graveyard was a tough enough sell. I love Tiamat coming out of the eye socket of the giant skull. And of course, Frank Walker doing the voice. Now, Tiamat was one of the characters from the... Uh, from the, the role-playing game. Yes, it was. There are quite a few elements from the role-playing game in it. It's just that, um, you know, we, we weren't treating it as a game. It was just the uh, backdrop for a series. You know, they find their weapons are much more powerful here. Something should be said about the music of the, sh- on the show as a whole. It's, um, it's quite exciting, I think. It's really a, a good score. Um, it's one of, one of my big pleasures in watching shows, listen to the soundtrack. 
nimble little dragon. What's happened to our weapons? I believe Tiamat doesn't speak very often now. And, and no, yeah. this is this is unusual to have her speak. But it was necessary. Was there a plan with this to kind of bring her more into the series? And well, in this particular one, we needed someone who could be a worthy foe for Avenger, and Tiamat was not the only one that measured up. Listen to this. <laughs> Frank really playing to the back uh, of the hall. And many people may not know that, that Frank Welker was also the voice of Uni and, and oh. uh, about 800 other animated characters over history. Yeah, the gag was always, uh, did you ever see a cartoon? Frank was in it. Okay, here's the key line. No kid your age should hate anybody this much. This is where Hank starts to realize that this is not the direction he wants to see Bobby go down. But no, no kid should ever hate anybody this much. That's right, yeah. And again, a, a hard line to sell, but uh, to their credit, the network realized that, that that's the crux of this show. You, you, you don't, you can't repay vengeance with vengeance. Oh, yeah, take that. I love that it just claps his wings and blows them away. Some nice animation in this sequence. I, I'm sure that yeah. Tiamat was probably extremely difficult for the animators to work on. Oh, yeah. Seven heads. Seven heads and seven different colored heads at that. Yes, exactly. Plus various limbs and stuff. Yeah, it was difficult. You notice that the heads don't move all the time, but it still it works very well. Now, even though this was animated in Japan by Toei, it, it still has, they, they, they kept the look fairly Americanized. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it certainly isn't uh, the anime look that became popular later. What we have all been waiting for. Arise. We're going to bring the, the ancient warriors to life here. What does he want? We're already standing up. Oh, not us. Uh, this is, of course, straight out of Harryhausen. I was going to say, that's your, that's your little Harryhausen homage. Homage there, yeah, exactly. For those of you who don't know who Harryhausen is, go out and find a copy of right. The Seven Voyages of Sinbad. And That's right. Or Jason and the Argonauts. Ray Harryhausen was uh, the inspiration for us all. Now, um, one of the things that the network insisted on was that if we destroyed any of these skeleton guys, for some reason, they, they only, we only do it if they turned to, to dirt or something. They couldn't really be bones. Which is why you may notice some of them turning brown as they crumble. And it was a strange note. See? Suddenly it becomes brown. Huh? It was odd, I don't know. It still works, though. Is that the strangest note you ever got from uh, Standards and Practices? Oh, no. I've had much, much stranger. Um, I mean... Notes along the lines of, you know, Marsha wouldn't say that type of thing. <laughs> now here, you get the idea that, uh, Benji gets the idea that, you know, maybe things aren't exactly going his way after all. Now this episode was actually the start of what you had kind of planned as a trilogy. That's right. This is the first episode of kind of an unofficial trilogy. The second one was the Dungeon at the Heart of Dawn, which was one of the first the ones in the third season. And uh, then the last one was, well, was going to be Requiem, which is, of course, the series finale that never got produced. Um, Requiem was going to spin the show in a different direction if we did get picked up for a fourth season. And if not, it would be the end of the series. And here Hank is ready to uh, do to the you, deed. Hank. What are you going to do? Like, what, uh, are you going to do it or not? He has to make the choice because he's he finally the got choice. the upper hand. Exactly, and Vinji knows it. I mean, look at him. So here goes the bolt, and we stop. This is the realization here that you cannot, you know, repay vengeance with vengeance. Why did you not finish me? If 
I did, we'd be no better than you are. There it is. We've beaten you, and you know it. So that's uh, Benger, <laughs> I didn't do it for you. The cross-eyed look is uh, not that great. <laughs> but what about you? Anyway, um, now would would you have uh, would this have then paid off in the final episode? Yeah, there's um there's some some references to it in there. Um, the basic idea is, is uh, in the final episode is that they they tend to split up in trying to decide which is the best way to get home. And it's something that we touch on in here a little bit, but they actually they actually come to almost to blows over it in the final episode. I don't get it. So uh, there's a whole thing on working together. And Dungeon Master just said, rise, my son, That's right. to, uh, to Venger. And that we learned in the final episode that Venger was indeed his son. Little Darth Vader touch there also. Uh, yeah, it works, though. I mean, these things, some of these things work because they work. Clichés often work because they're, they're, they work. And that's that. I've re- I've, I really enjoy writing the episode, and I've gotten a lot of really good uh, response to it over the years. Is this your favorite episode of Dungeons and Dragons? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, certainly the favorite one I've written. It's one of my favorite scripts of all time. And I've written about 400 scripts, so believe me, it's saying a lot. Well, thank you for joining us on this commentary, Michael. Thank you very much. <laughs>